And then next, Amanda Johnson, the diplomat in residence, will be talking about her experience and career opportunities in the US Foreign Services. Then we'll have a Q&A session where you are all encouraged to ask as many questions as you'd like about the field and um, anything related. So welcome everyone. We are so happy to have you attend the second event of Sigma Yada Rho at Alpha Summer Series. Sigma Yada Rho inducts and rewards outstanding student scholars in international studies. This honor society was first established in 1984 and now claims 190 chapters around the world. The Webster University chapter, named Eta Alpha, was established primarily as a means to honor those students who have excelled academically and have shown extracurricular achievement at Webster University. The goal of our summer event series is to introduce our members to the breadth of possibilities available to those who are occupying the self in the international relations field, ranging from graduate schools working in the US Europe, and even in the international community. Today, we'll be hearing from an individual with an extensive experience in the American Foreign Services. So today, we are honored to welcome a career civil servant with a very exciting background. Amanda has worked in Brussels, Poland, Lebanon, Algeria, Nigeria, and Washington. In addition to English, Amanda speaks Arabic, French, and intermediate German. Currently, she recruits for the U.S. Department of State in the Central Region. Welcome, Amanda. The floor is yours. Thank you, Danielle and Anna, and thank you so much for joining us. I also have today with me David, um, a rival cross town from WashU. He's interning we with me this summer, uh, so great to be here. Um, so yeah, if you just bear with me, I'll share my screen, and I'll just do a brief presentation and uh, and then I can open it up for Q and A. And yes, so <clears throat> with the State Department, we're looking for a diverse group of talented Americans uh, for a whole host of careers. And every academic discipline is useful with the State Department, particularly international relations. So we are a relatively small federal agency. There's only about 77,000 of us. And then the Foreign Service is unique. We're not civil servants. The Foreign Service is a cadre of professional diplomats um, that are structured uh, similar to that of uniformed military officers. So we have officers who serve as generalists. That's my role. Um, there's about 8,000 of us, and there's about 6,000 specialists, um, everything from engineers to IT professionals, doctors, uh, HR, admin, all of that type of stuff. So this is a picture of me on my second tour in Algeria many, many moons ago. Um, I was in Adrar, Algeria, and the gentleman uh, standing next to me is a member of parliament. He was the head of an opposition party, and he was also head of the Algerian scouts. Uh, and we had done a program, I was a cultural affairs officer at the embassy, we'd done a program in partnership with the American Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts that brought senior leaders of those organizations to Algeria to engage with the Algerian Muslim Scouts. They're designated Muslim because when it used to be out of that. But at any rate, uh, we then sent uh, Algerian scouts to the US to do homestays and engage and, and uh, the three organizations have stayed in contact ever since. For me, it was great. We're standing in front of a, a traditional mosque in the Sahara. Um, you'll see the style of mosque in North Africa and Mali, uh, made out of an adobe-like substance with uh, timbers. Um, and for me, this is the first time I was in the Northern Sahara. Uh, in my first tour when I was in Lagos, Nigeria, some friends and I, um, when it was a different security environment, we had done a road trip from Lagos, Nigeria to Timbuktu, Mali. And so I had been to the Southern and Northern uh, extremes of the Sahara, but of course had never crossed it. Um, we also have about 10,000 civil service employees. So civil service uh, serve only domestically largely in Washington, DC, and a host of areas. And you'll see that the bulk of our employees are actually foreign nationals who work at our embassies and consulates overseas. Without whom, we would be lost. 
So there's many paths to success with the State Department. You can be a Foreign Service Officer like myself, and we have those five career tracks uh, that you can see. My career track is public diplomacy, but I also do a lot of policy. We also have specialists who are highly specialized in certain areas and support of that civil service. And for those of you who speak Mandarin, Portuguese, Arabic, or Spanish, you could also be a counselor fellow. Um, and then we have a host of uh, internships and fellowships. So a little pop quiz. Can anyone tell me who this uh, woman is in the picture? Feel free to shout it out. Mrs. Rice? Yes, yeah, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Uh, she was President Bush's second uh, Secretary of State during his second term. And she's visiting here in Morocco. And this gentleman to her right, he is a Foreign Service Officer, but he joined the Foreign Service through one of our fellowship programs, the Wrangell and Pickering Fellowships. And the gentleman here is the head of her security detail. Um, so even though in the media, and I sat in several meetings with Secretary Rice when I had the Libya account, um, you know, the focus of course is on the principal because they're the ones who um, are doing the direct engagement, but there's a whole army of people, as you can see, um, usually lots of women, this just happened to have captured men with her, um, who make diplomacy happen. So as a foreign service officer, you can serve in one of five career tracks, consular. So that would be a crisis response uh, and management. That would be supporting American citizens and visas. So all of the American citizens that have been uh, able to come back home with assistance from the government during the pandemic, that was all facilitated by foreign service officers, of course, in partnership with other relevant government agencies. We have the economic career track. They do trade, uh, promote US business, but also everything to do with science diplomacy from fisheries to global health to uh, space. Uh, management officers, they deal internally with systems, uh, people and resources. Uh, political officers do traditional kind of internal and external relations with the go a government or in a multilateral setting. They also deal with human rights, refugees, migration, uh, security issues as well, coordinating with the military. And public diplomacy, we do uh, press, social media. Um, we also do um, uh, cultural exchanges. So I think we have someone trying to join us and I just wanna make sure that they are not uh, excluded. So Sonia Benchik. Okay. Oh, sorry, my mistake. There we go. And feel free to just shout it out. Can anyone recognize the gentleman in this photo? He's NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. He was the previously Prime Minister of Norway. He's been the Secretary General of NATO, I think, for three or four years. Um, and in April of last year, while I was at NATO and I helped support this as well, um, we marked the 70th anniversary of the founding of the uh, alliance. Um, and the alliance was started by the Washington Treaty. So all of and formed the alliance in Washington. So to mark that, uh, the Secretary of State hosted his counterparts for a foreign ministerial, and the Secretary General came, and he met with the president, he met with various cabinet members, and he also gave um, remarks to a joint session of Congress. And you can see the vice president and speaker behind him. Uh, and that was the first time the head of a multilateral organization had ever uh, addressed a joint session of Congress. And there's strong bipartisan support uh, for NATO and its mission. And I highlight this because um, this, of course, uh, like uh, Secretary Rice's visit to Morocco, which is a little bit lower key compared to this, this doesn't happen on its own. <laughs> so all of my colleagues who have these different portfolios played a critical role in making this happen. So our consular colleagues, they made sure that 
all of the international members of NATO and diplomats had the appropriate visas in order to travel and attend the event and on time. Our economic uh, officers were dealing with energy security issues in preparation for this ministerial because um, NATO is based on consensus. So we had uh, all of these meetings at NATO with members of uh, states to discuss what exactly we wanted to propose for foreign ministers for their approval on aspects of energy security in Europe. Um, our management officers made everything work from the venues to uh, booking planes to getting people where they needed to be to set up rooms so there could be press conferences, all of that, uh, booking hotel rooms, uh, facilitating the logistics and protocol of all of these high level meetings that took place. Uh, they were engaged in that. And our political officers uh, were very active in uh, negotiating uh, the topics and preparing our principles for the bulk of the summit. So the Secretary of State's paper was drafted by my colleagues in Brussels. It was reviewed by everyone in Washington and contributed to and that's how we had it set up. And for me in public diplomacy, I was the head of our press shop. My ambassador, former Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison from Texas, uh, she did a host of media engagements, live TV interviews, press conference in Brussels. Um, and then she went to Washington. She participated in live hits with TV there as well. Uh, the Secretary General, the Secretary of State, various uh, foreign ministers were doing lots of media and press either on the record or behind the scenes. So all of us together have an important component of foreign policy and in diplomacy and making this type of things happen. So we do have um, a, an extensive process, but a very transparent and merit-based process to join the Foreign Service. Uh, you first take a test, and I apologize, I should have updated this. We, we've just completed the uh, this testing session and the next test will be offered in October. And then we review kind of like your background to make sure you have the minimum requirements. Um, you have an oral assessment based on in person if you succeed to that step with other people uh, focused on what I'll discuss in a second, the 13 dimensions. And then security and medical clearances, we do a final review of your file and then you go on to the register. And if there's questions, I'm happy to discuss it in greater detail, um, and I will send you a link with more information as well. So 13 dimensions, you know, I don't know if I would have branded it as dimensions, but, um, but definitely it's soft skills. And I would say this is critical for anything that you do, whether you're interested in joining the Foreign Service or working in government or private sector or nonprofit, these are the type of soft skills that everyone is looking for. And for us, it's critical because you're joining the Foreign Service. We are a rank in person organization. So you join our cadre and you automatically have a career ladder to progress. And so we want to make sure you have these key skills. So composure, cultural adaptability, resourcefulness, working well with others, written oral communication, planning and organizing, as you can imagine, pulling off a foreign ministerial <laughs> of 20, then 29, now 30 member states um, is quite a challenge. And if you speak Mandarin, Portuguese, Arabic, or Spanish, you can um, participate in the Consular Fellows Program. And it's a great way to get your foot in the door. You would do the same work that a, a consular officer would do at the entry level. And you get to be in the belly of the beast and kind of see what Foreign Service uh, life is like and, uh, and develop mentors. Even if your interest longer term is not in the consular realm, uh, I can tell you all roads lead to visas. <laughs> so you will deal with it your entire professional life if you join the Foreign Service and having this background is very useful. So, and it will help you develop those 13 uh, dimensions in order to join the Foreign Service as well, if that's something that you're interested in. We also have several student programs. So available right now, you could apply for the Virtual Student Federal Service Internship. It's completely online. You don't have to leave your home or your city. The deadline is the 31st. You'll see all these various um, specific internships you can apply to. And uh, I do have uh, availability for an intern with me uh, in the fall. David is interning over the summer, so that's something to look at. If you have financial need, you could also 
look at applying for a paid internship through us because we want to break down barriers of access. And if you're interested in joining the Foreign Service while also getting a graduate degree, as long as you have that 3.2 GPA um, and uh, you have financial need, you have a minority background or a woman, you can apply for these fellowships as well and join the Foreign Service that way. We also have unpaid internships. I was never able to do that as a student. I did not have uh, the money. Um, but that's something that we anticipate we will advertise in September. And, you know, we have study abroad opportunities uh, for Pell Grant recipients, for uh, children of active duty military members. Uh, you can study languages fully funded um, in summer 2021, of course, assuming that the healthcare situation permits. Um, and there's other opportunities as well. So I'm definitely your local resource. Um, you can reach me uh, via this email address at any time. I will send you an email later today if you signed up. I'm also on social media, on Facebook, and you can find the State Department on Instagram and on LinkedIn. So I'm sorry that in the virtual uh, setting, I can't see your faces while I'm presenting at the same time or address any questions, but I'm happy to do so if you want to review anything. And I'm happy just to talk about life in the Foreign Service and my experiences as well. So Amanda, what really stands out to the Foreign Services in a candidate, especially an undergrad that just graduated? So I joined straight out of undergrad. I joined in 2002. Um, I did take five years because I double majored and got two degrees. Um, although professors told me not to, <laughs> I did it anyway. Um, and so I joined at 24. And really it's those 13 dimensions, it's those soft skills. And we don't care how you acquire them, we care that you have them. So if you do a lot of prestigious, um, programs and exchanges and all that type of stuff. That's fantastic. Congratulations. I'm sure that gave you a great experience. But if you also have been a barista at Starbucks or have been working on campus or volunteering or active in maybe personal uh, responsibilities you might have, you get to the same uh, you know, path, the same destination as well. So it really is um, how do you acquire these skills and how do you demonstrate that you acquire them? So for people interested in joining the Foreign Service, I recommend that they do two things. And I will send you an email with a bunch of links if you sign up with all this information. Um, I recommend taking our practice Foreign Service Officer Test. We do not track how you do. We don't care how you do. So just go, if you take it, just kind of zen out, just sit down and take it. Don't worry about anything. They're real questions from previous tests, and it'll give you an assessment on the various areas, how well you did and the likelihood that you would pass. And why that's useful is then you can use that as a baseline for a strategy. You know, you've been studying IR, you'll probably do really, really well on some of the areas. Maybe you haven't studied management principles. Maybe you struggled on English expression. Um, maybe you struggled with judgment questions. That way you can focus on what you need to build and not waste time you know, just getting better at what you're already good at. The other thing I recommend is taking those 13 dimensions and doing a self-assessment to yourself. Write down a bullet list for each one. You know, cultural adaptability. Maybe you, um, you know, your cultural adaptability was adapting to the US. <laughs> um, maybe you have a multicultural family. Maybe it's different cultures because you grew up in the military and civilian life is a different culture or what have you. So you just write down those bullet points. And if you see areas where you're not as strong, well, then you can take that into account when you seek either opportunities as a student or in your early work life, if you decide to apply later, of how you can build those skills. Um, for me personally, I was an admin assistant my entire university career. 
Um, my parents had just graduated from college themselves. I was a Pell Grant student. I was a work study student. And as they had worked for a couple years, you know, I, I didn't qualify for those programs, but I continued to work in the summers. So I basically was a receptionist and a secretary. And I developed a lot of those <laughs> organization and planning skills. And I was very active in student groups. I was active in Model UN, Model Arab League. And over the course of my academic career, like Daniela and Anna, I gained a leadership position in the organization. I put on conferences um, uh, for regional conferences for college students, all that type of stuff. So I developed those skills in that way. Um, and I didn't leave Montana really where I was from. I had two brief opportunities, one through work and one through a scholarship to travel to Japan and Kuwait, but they were each one week programs. And for our students that are not American nationals, is there any place for them that they could fit in? Yeah, so the reason why we don't accept non-US citizens is because you're formally representing the US government to a foreign government. So you need to be um, a citizen. But I just shared a link, exchanges.state.gov. We have a host of programs. Um, I worked on them throughout my career as a public affairs officer at our embassies and consulates overseas. And if you've heard of the Fulbright program, International Visitor Leadership Program, there's a whole host of exchange programs that uh, foreign students can look into, or maybe they're familiar with, and maybe that's how they are studying at Weber to begin with. So I, if you are not an American citizen, I do recommend going to the website of the embassy of the country that you're from. And you can find lots of information that way. There's probably also an American center or an American corner. It might be called something unique to your country, like a Lincoln Center or whatever it might be. Um, but basically, that's a way for you to engage as well. So if you find yourself at home because of the pandemic or visiting family in the summers, you can definitely engage there. And if any of you have aspirations to be American citizens and you're going through the process of being naturalized, that's fantastic. The second you have your naturalization papers in your hand, you can apply to the Foreign Service. And if that's your goal, then you definitely could work now in preparation for that. So Amanda, I have a question to you. Concerning mm -hmm. languages, a lot of people who are studying international relations are aiming and seeking for the best possible opportunities to learn as much languages as, they, as many languages as they can. So, for example, I know a lot of people, and actually, I'm at the same pass of the decision of whether to choose French or Spanish. What mm -hmm. would be your opinion in terms of um, usefulness and also? Um, usage of the language in the foreign service field, probably not uh, only in the US, but also just in general, your opinion on the availability of um, people who are studying IR and who are deeply involved in this field, and especially who want to conduct the career paths in the diplomacy services, what will be useful for them in terms of these language opportunities? Sure. Um, I think you can look at it in several ways. Very narrowly, for those who are interested in joining the Foreign Service, um, we will teach you whatever language you need to learn. So I uh, majored in French and minored in German in college. But um, for those who are Native American uh, English speakers and have studied foreign languages, it's probably still the same. It's very focused on literature and culture, not so much on politics, economy, um, what a diplomat would focus on. So even I had, uh, I had four years of high school French, uh, five years of college French, but I did get additional French instruction just to learn that vocab uh, and, and be in that world as opposed to the academic uh, cultural world. Um, I learned Arabic from scratch. So I had served in Algeria, only spoke French. And um, I learned Arabic from scratch because I was assigned to Beirut and they assigned me two years in advance knowing that that would give me time to get the Arabic. So the only distinction for the State Department to join the Foreign Service, you technically don't need to speak a foreign language, we will teach it to you. Um, however, if you do speak a foreign language, and it happens to be one of very many of the most common ones, and by common, I mean common to Europe, common to Asia, common to Africa and Latin America, there's a wide array, array of languages you could uh, speak. If you speak one very well, 
If you get to the point to where you pass the oral assessment, you can take a test and get extra points and therefore go higher on the register and therefore have a greater likelihood of being called into an orientation class. So if you're being Machiavellian about it, better to speak one of those languages really well as opposed to be exposed to many languages. Um, putting the State Department aside uh, and just thinking about careers and IR in general, first I would assess what geographic region are you most interested in? Or is it a, is it a topic like human rights? Uh, or what have you, and then see what's cross-cutting. For those, especially international students, uh, people who are interested in the UN, speaking English and French is immensely valuable. If you have any uh, interest in engaging uh, in international affairs from any governmental context, and even NGO. And then you go into regions. So if you're interested in Latin American, naturally Spanish would be very good. <laughs> Secondarily, Portuguese. Um, if you're looking at Africa, just because of the history of colonialism, English and French, and secondarily Spanish and Portuguese are very useful. Um, if you're just focusing on, say, East Africa, well, then naturally Swahili would be useful, or more North Africa in the Sahel Arabic, um, of course, the Middle East Arabic. Um, uh, East Asia, Chinese or Japanese is really your gateway into being a, a engaged in that region. And for members uh, of the EU or aspirants of the EU, I mean, having beautiful French will open so many career opportunities in Europe. And I saw that firsthand in Brussels. So really start with where you are and where you wanted to go and then do that calculus. David, would you like to open up about your experience so far, maybe a little bit about your application process and interview process and what you've seen in your past two weeks starting off? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, to start with, I'd say that this summer presents kind of a unique set of circumstances. So my application and interview process was really more of a, I reached out to Amanda with questions like I'm sure a lot of you had about what joining the Foreign Service would look like. And then at the end of our call, um, I just asked if she would need any help in her office this summer. Uh, and that's really, that's really all it was. Um, from there, I went uh, through my school to get approval for the internship, um, to get some academic credit for that. Uh, and then, yeah, we just got started from there. Um, in these first couple of weeks, my job has been a lot of uh, reaching out to people in primarily the St. Louis area. Um, because Amanda has her five states uh, and has been trying to build more of a presence in this St. Louis area uh, and the Missouri area in general. Uh, and yeah, so I've been able to reach out to some people both at my school and at SLU and at other schools around the, the St. Louis area and talk to them and set up, uh, kind of start setting up meetings so that Amanda can get uh, in contact and engage further with, with different groups throughout the area. It's kind of my elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. And in normal circumstances, uh, it was total target of opportunity, we would, we would say. David was interested, and I was like, I could use an intern. And I was like, and as long as you can make your school, you know, bless it and go through the formal process there, let's do that and help me get set up for the fall because we will be doing virtual engagements through the end of the year, regardless. And then we'll reassess from there. So the virtual student federal service. So for those of you who are American citizens, you can go to bsfs.state.gov. Um, and it is a great opportunity uh, to not only intern with the State Department next, next academic year, but um, with numerous federal agencies in a whole host of areas. Um, so applications are open now. You can apply um, in uh, uh, by July 31st. And um, here, I'll pull up mine. And then if you're interested in interning with me, um, you feel free to reach out to David and get the real scoop as well. Um, you can uh, work, um, excuse me, I'll just do, doing a quick search. Uh, you can work with me uh, next year and I would love to have somebody in the St. Louis area again as well. 
Um, and then otherwise, it's, it's pretty straightforward about our other applications. The main thing is your personal narrative, um, making that very tight, making it very focused about uh, you, your goals, and how you will be able to contribute to the mission as defined. Um, uh, specifically, and um, when I send you an email, if you sign up at our tiny URL, I will send you a link to a Facebook Live presentation we did on how to craft a, a personal narrative for internships. And that's useful regardless of what you do. I, I'd really, if you're interested in uh, preparing yourself to apply for the foreign service, I'd look at that as well. We give concrete examples of weak writing and concrete examples of strong writing. And some of it is style. Academic writing is not how people write in the workplace. Um, it's different. Journalistic writing, of course, is different as well. Even lawyers have uh, troubles sometimes with writing for the State Department or with government because they have their own way of writing as well, which tends to be very thorough, very long. And in government, it's more get straight to the point. In your day to day, um, before you started working as a recruitment officer, um, did you write a lot of policy? What was your What's what's the writing component of this job? Because I feel it's very heavy. Sure, it's heavy writing. And the nice thing about being a foreign service officer, it's not too uncommon from being an undergraduate student. So you choose a career track. So consular economic management, political public diplomacy, and that is your major. That's under which you will get your degree. That's what you'll be assessed for promotion. That's where you'll spend the bulk of your career. But we want you to be a well-rounded officer. So we want you to minor in another career track. And for me, that's policy. We want you to major in a geographic region. For me, that's the Middle East. And minor in another, Europe for me. And so in that way, you can really pursue your interests um, and really guide your career. So I always was interested in Francophone Africa, West or North. I desperately wanted a French speaking post my first tour. I got Lagos instead, which was so much more happening, Less larger scene, better personal life for sure there. So I, I think they just knew me <laughs> and that would be a better fit for me. Um, but then you can see I went to North Africa, the Middle East and then Europe. And so that's what I wanted to do. Those were the types of jobs I applied for as an assignment and those are the ones that I've got. So when I was doing policy, I was doing a lot of what we'd say uh, engagement with contacts. So that would be, so when I was the Libya desk officer, that was being the umbilical cord between our embassy in Tripoli and the Libyan embassy in Washington. And at that moment in time, I needed to be the expert on the bilateral relationship. And if I didn't know it, I needed to know who did. Now that didn't mean that I was the be all end all. <laughs> I was, I was the cog in that little machine. Um, and I worked very closely with the military. I worked very closely with various other uh, bureaus and offices in Washington, DC. I worked very closely uh, with the embassy, um, with the assistant secretary for the Middle East at that time, because we were negotiating a claims agreement for past uh, victims of terrorism from the 70s and 80s that Libya, uh, Muammar Gaddafi had, had undertaken all of that type of stuff. Um, and so I was constantly attending meetings, taking notes, uh, doing assessments of what I needed to share with my community who was interested in Libyan issues, um, with leadership at the embassy, with my leadership. Um, I would be the first drafter of all paper that was used by officials for meetings. If they're in Washington at the embassy, if the ambassador had a meeting, then his staff or her staff would do that, but that's what I would do. But the key thing about government work, it's a collective effort. It is not Amanda Johnson army of one. <laughs> so I would draft the information. I would kind of be the main grunt, but it would be seen by 10 or 20 people and they would have their own take and they would have their own edits. So you're gonna see lots of red, you're gonna see lots of track changes. You just have to remove yourself as this is about me as an individual, it's not and just know that you are contributing to the collective. So when Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice met with senior living officials, I sat in the room with her at the State Department and I was the note taker. 
Now, obviously, I didn't contribute to meetings. <laughs> that was between her. And if she had a question, she would ask the assistant secretary. But the person who wrote the cables, who documented what happened, who then told other leadership and the embassy what had transpired. So we knew, what do we need to do? How did the meeting go? Were there any takeaways, any do outs? So tasks for the embassy or for my office or my leadership to undertake as a result. All of that you do as a desk officer. And it's critical because you kind of see how the sausage gets made. You know what is of interest to leadership. So when you're at an embassy, you know what Washington needs. And then you also know what maybe your ambassador or your deputy chief of mission needs that not, doesn't necessarily impact Washington. So you kind of you know, you, you really compartmentalize a lot of information and, and make a lot of linkages. So it can be just thrilling <laughs> and wonderful because you learn so much in such a short time about what's going on. Sometimes it can be daunting. Um, you know, the Secretary Rice went to Libya. She was the first Secretary of State to visit Libya in like 50 years. So that was a huge undertaking. Um, so on the policy side, that's what you do. On public affairs, I got to uh, get to know so many young Algerians and who I'm actually still in touch with, even though it's been like 15 years since I was in the country. And they did programs with us and they went on to bigger and brighter things and they founded NGOs and they're working in Europe and they're doing other fabulous things. Same in Lebanon, got to work a lot with kids, got to work with the NBA. So there's, so many things you get to do and you can do it for a period of time and kind of switch gears and do something else and then switch gears again and do something else. Does anyone else have questions? Um, I have a question regarding also um, academic backgrounds mm -hmm. and work again in the IR field. So a lot of students, um, as far as I know, uh, starting to you know thinking of their degree as something that might help them um, in advance to gain some career paths in different fields and spheres. And in terms of foreign services, what would you suggest if you, uh, you see an application of a student who is largely majoring in IR, but also which minors would you suggest would be extremely valuable? for such a student if we're talking about uh, American educational system where you can choose several minors. Mm -hmm. So what would be your uh, idea and opinion on that issue and whether it's so much important that usually a student are thinking of? Sure, so I'll answer that in two ways. I'll answer that from a foreign service perspective and then the rest of the world perspective. In the foreign service, we don't care what you study. Technically, you don't even need a, a degree to apply to the foreign service, but the likelihood that you would pass the written exam and go through the qualification evaluations panel is not that high without a degree. So having that IR background, I mean, that's a good uh, sound basis. You'll find that a lot of topics on the written exam are covered to that, but when I joined in 2002, we had a class of 99. We had a ballet dancer, an actor, a Philly cop, a former taxi cab driver. I mean, we had all sorts of people from all walks of life. So to join the Foreign Service, what's really critical is that you can pass the Foreign Service Officer Test, which having IR is a great background, but you can always study for that test as well. Um, and then you have to get through the qualifications panel and the oral assessment. So for us, we, especially compared to other um, diplomatic services of other countries, we're much more egalitarian. Um, we are much more transparent. We do not have this entrenched class system that other diplomatic services have. Um, even in the British and German Foreign Service, um, you get to jump the queue if you have a master's degree, which um, that they have that distinction. Um, we don't have that distinction at all. We just care that you know what you know and you can do what you can do. Um, so in that regard, I would say if you're interested in the American Foreign Service, pursue your passions. If you want to have an IR major in a biology minor or a poetry minor or an engineering minor or whatever the case may be, do that if that's what you know sparks your joy, as they say. Um, if you are an international student and you're interested in 
the uh, diplomatic service of your home country, odds are they are not like us. Um, they are going to be expecting that you have all of those traditional uh, IR degrees, that you went to certain schools, uh, even back home that you went to certain schools or you did certain things. So if you're from that society, you probably know what your society is like. And they're probably looking for a much more structured way um, of that. So I would then consider what do you want to focus on in your career? Do you want to be an Arabist, a Europeanist, um, you know, uh, an Asia hand, whatever it is, then focus your studies in that regard. Um, I was studying Arabic in Cairo with uh, Japanese diplomats, British diplomats, people from other Japanese diplomats, that was it, they learned Arabic, they would spend their entire career in the Middle East and they had no choice, they couldn't leave it whatsoever. And they would spend five years in a certain country, we only do two or three years. Um, and as you noted, I can hop around. If I wanted to only do Latin America, I could only do Latin America, it's completely up to me. I mean, I have to prove myself, I have to get those connections, but I'm the driver of what I want to focus on in that regard. Um, in other diplomatic services, that's not the case. So that's kind of the real world take on that one. <laughs> Going off that real world take, I had one more question. Um, before you had gone into this career, is there anything that you wish you would have known? Is there anything that is a little unexpected or unpleasant part of the job that you had to adapt to? Sure. Well, one thing I wish I knew is what I was getting into in the application process. And the good news, I started that in 2000. We're completely transparent. I just got a letter, show up to San Francisco on this date. I had no idea what would happen. Um, I, you know, I was just lucky the stars aligned. Um, I, there was no practice test to take. I just sat down and took the test. Um, so all of that is transparent. There's tools because we want you on your best day. Um, for me, I, you know, was from Montana. I did travel. I did Model UN. That took me to New York and San Francisco and Chicago and other places. I did get to do those two short trips to Japan and Kuwait, but I really hadn't spent any time overseas or another environment. And I went from Montana to DC to Lagos, Nigeria, a mega city in Africa. <laughs> And, you know, you see on the news, of course, they tend to focus on the negative aspect because that's what entices viewers and therefore that's what uh, gets the money for their business models so they can continue to be journalists. Um, but I didn't know what it would be like to live in a community of 20 million people and to see just true abject poverty. That was a total shock. So getting picked up at the airport and driving through the city of Lagos, that, that was eye opening. And then I was a visa officer, which was so valuable. I sat and I knew everything about a cross section of Nigerian society because they all came to my window for various reasons, students, professionals, um, sadly people who clearly wanted to immigrate to the United States. And although I did not blame them, it was my job to not let them do that. My job was to make sure people came and, and went and came back home. Um, and so I learned so much about that, but it was overwhelming having all of that personal interaction. So for the first two weeks, I think I would go home, I'd turn off the lights, I'd light the candle, I'd listen to very chill classical music. And I just had the Zen because I needed to recharge because I had not been accustomed to engaging with so many people in that regard. Other people will, thrive off of it. They're huge extroverts, but I wasn't. So in many ways, even if I knew, I think I just had to go through that experience. And Lagos was a very challenging tour, but it was so great uh, personally because there were so many people my age, young couples or single people, um, or everybody were our parents' age, empty nesters, and they spoiled us to death. And there was so much to do. We had such great adventures. And I grew stronger from the experience. So literally every single tour I've had since Lagos, I was like, ah, well, that's nothing. I survived Lagos. So it was really easy, you know, to kind of take things in stride. So sometimes you just have to be thrown in the deep end with that structure. You still have big Uncle Sam, the nice friendly embrace wherever you are, because uh, you're in that embassy environment. You're not on your own. Uh, but sometimes you just have to be thrown into the deep end to know that you can do it.
So now Brandon, oh. Zia, Sonia, do you guys have any questions or Mark or Tiffany? Hi, um, I don't know if you can hear me. My name is Zia Clements. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 100% sure what I want to do after undergrad. Uh, I was considering foreign service, but I'm also considering going to law school. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's any place for people with law degrees in the foreign service. There are loads of people with law degrees in the Foreign Service. There are loads of people who had zero intention of practicing law, but got a law degree and joined the Foreign Service. <laughs> so um, you don't need a law degree to join the Foreign Service. It doesn't necessarily give you a leg up. Obviously, you learn a lot of great things. So if you're passionate about the law and that's what you would like to do, even if you still want to pursue the Foreign Service, then I would encourage you to go to law school. But if you think you need to go to law school to check a box, please don't do that. <laughs> um, definitely uh, do uh, what you're passionate about because then you will find uh, opportunities with the Foreign Service or elsewhere. So it's great training, it's great background. Actually, my dad went to law school when I was a middle school and high school student. So I got to see that a little bit uh, firsthand. Um, but uh, if that's what you want to do, that's great. A lot of lawyers um, tend to gravitate to consular work because immigration law. Um, a lot of lawyers uh, sometimes gravitate to political work because we do a lot of work on uh, good governance, democracy promotion, uh, justice reform. We do all of that type of stuff. So it's really up to you where your interests lie. Um, for those of you who really are like committed, I want to join the Foreign Service. I also want to go to graduate school. Um, if you're going to be applying for graduate school this fall or this coming year, definitely look at the Pickering and Wrangell fellowships. I will send you that link. Again, 3.2 GPA or higher, women, minorities, or anybody with any background who has financial need. You can do that and it's successful. We pay for your graduate degree. You get two paid internships, um, one domestic, one overseas, and a five-year commitment as a foreign service officer. So it's very prestigious. Um, and if you're interested, let me know. Happy to work with you. And your campus likely has a coordinator for national prestigious scholarships like Rhodes and that type of thing that helps candidates in that regard as well. Thank you. So Brandon asked a question. Um, he said, how has COVID-19 impacted my day-to-day? -day? Uh, and those are the departments. So we're working virtually. Um, actually, I technically have always been working virtually because I am the only Department of State employee in, the, in Oklahoma. Um, and so um, my, wherever I am is my office. Uh, at present, um, we are not doing in-person engagements, as you can imagine. Uh, the health situation doesn't permit it. So although I would normally be doing in-person engagements, I'm doing everything virtually. So a lot of career fairs uh, virtually, you've probably seen those advertised. I know uh, Weber is going to have one, I think it's October 6th. You're going to have your all majors uh, virtual career fair, and I hope to join that one as well. Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, and uh, these types of engagements as well. And we're also doing a lot of engagements with uh, national societies, uh, like Society of Engineers or um, liberal arts colleges, that type of thing. We've been doing a lot of virtual engagement. So I get my steps pacing through my house. Tiffany, Mark, Sonia, any questions? So if there are no more questions, we would like to thank everyone for coming. And we are grateful to have so enthusiastic group of students who are really caring about their career prospects. And we would like to thank you, Amanda and David, for, for joining us today and for sharing your experience and knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's such a pleasure. Oh, go ahead, Danielle. Sorry, you're on mute. Oh. No, I'm just going to say thank you, everyone, as well. And I've linked our Facebook and Instagram link if um, you'd like to know about our other events we're going to be having this summer um, in the month of July. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I sent the tiny URL again as well. So feel free to 
click on that and I'll send you an email later today. Please stay in touch. I do weekly office uh, hours. So if you want to reach out to me via email, dircentral at state.gov, we can arrange a time for a one-on-one -on -one, um, and all of that good stuff. So best of luck, stay safe, stay healthy, safe travels for those of you who are outside of St. Louis. Thank um, you so much, Amanda, for talking to us. All right, take care, bye.